Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. I'm Jeff Anderson. And on behalf of the uh, community partners of Dynamic Learning, welcome to our 62nd program. We're glad you could be with us this evening. And we actually call these classes. So I hope you enjoy coming back to class. Without further ado, let's get to the program. We're excited. You know Apollo is the greatest peacetime technological achievement in human history. I didn't say that, but it's all over the internet. We hope it's not fake news, but I think it's pretty true, right? <laughs> Tonight we introduce six men who we know were pioneers. They were there in the infancy when it was a cow pasture right outside of Houston. And each of these pioneers has helped make possible what we have experienced and what we know make, became the manned space exploration programs in America. Together they have a combined 184 years of NASA experience. And so coming to our stage tonight is a one-of-a-kind learning experience. First, let's meet Norman Chaffee. And if you could suppress your, keep your applause as Norm comes out. Uh, and we'll introduce all the men, and then, we can, and then we can applaud them. Norman. Norman uh, started, he's coming somewhere. <laughs> Norman started as a propulsion engineer at NASA's Manned Space Center in 1962. And in a world of rocket science, excuse me, I'm supposed to forward the slide. Norman's the one who attacked the problems where the thrust was important and the propulsion needed to happen. He spent 36 years and he contributed to every single part of the NASA program that we now call our space exploration. Norm's thankful for those years. And he says in a sly but a Norman type way that he's so thankful and he is so appreciative that the American taxpayer paid his way to enjoy all those years. He's a real live rocket scientist right here on our stage tonight. And he's mentored since he retired thousands of kids and teachers in, in, as an education disciple. Now meet Tom Mosier. Surprise. Hey, Tom. Tom is the system specialist. You didn't know Tom looked that young at one point, did you? <laughs> and Tom um, is the guy that is uh, responsible, as you'll see much more in this program, for the American flag that actually uh, became such an Amer a symbol of, Amer of, of our success in space that was on placed on the moon. Tom's career began in 1963, and it spanned key positions in every human spaceflight program from Mercury to the space station. He served as a senior manager of the space shuttle program, and he literally calls it from, ske from sketch pad to launch pad. Then he was the director of the Johnson Space Center's uh, engineering area. He moved to Washington, where he became the first director of the space station program. He's a distinguished alum of the uh, uh, Texas, uh, University of Texas College of Engineering, and he is the man most responsible for making what we're going to enjoy tonight. Thank you, Tom, possible. Meet Tommy Holloway. Tommy's a mechanical engineer fresh out of the University of Arkansas in 1963, that is. Tommy worked, <laughs> Tommy worked in flight crew operations during Gemini. He was a flight activities officer in the mission control for Apollo. He was a flight director for the space shuttle program. And ultimately, Tommy's leadership set the standards for safety that are still used today and those were all set during the primary guidelines there were set during the Space Shuttle International Space Program. We recognize Tommy tonight because he's the only man on our stage that went 50 years with NASA. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Tommy, you haven't aged that much. <laughs> all right, meet Jerry Griffin. Uh, 
Jerry's one of our great Kerrville locals. He graduated from Texas A&M. He later, he later served on the Board of Regents of the University. Uh, we have a hook'em going over here, okay. But there's been a little competition, all right? But these guys love each other, I know. After serving in the Air Force, he joined Mission Control in 1964. He served as a flight director for Ever Apollo Manned Mission from Apollo 7 to 17. Of the six manned list uh, landings on the moon, Jerry was the flight director for half of them. After Apollo, he went and became deputy director at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and then he returned to Houston as the director of the Johnson Space Center, where he'd begun in a cow pasture, if I remember right. Still a very busy man, he just arrived in from Los Angeles, where he helped advise and work on a theatrical production about Apollo 11 that premiered last night next to the Rose Bowl in a special theater. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Fred Hayes. Fred. Fred grew up actually reading. One of his favorite things to do was to read comics about Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. Little did he know that he would become a real life space hero himself. He holds the existing record for the furthest distance ever traveled by man from the Earth. After seven years as a NASA test pilot, he joined in the class, the astronaut class of 1966. He served on the backup crews of Apollo 8, 11, and 16. He flew as the lunar module pilot, pilot on Apollo 13. That's the mission where failure is not an option became synonymous with the American space program. Later, he served as commander on several flight, uh, test flights on the Space Shuttle Enterprise. You'll see later that it was launched from a 747. Amazing. He's been portrayed on the silver screen in the film Apollo 13 and in HBO's From the Earth to the Moon. And he just flew in this afternoon from New York City where he's been at a Christie's auction. And last night he was auctioned off for a dinner in New York City. Thanks for being here, Fred. <laughs> Now, meet Jack Lausman. Jack's a graduate of the University of Michigan. Come in behind me. Come on, Jack. Jack's a latecomer to uh, not just to the program tonight, but to the Hill Country. <laughs> but he knew where to come to enjoy a special sense of life, he and Gracia. Jack was a pilot in the Marines when he got a call from Alan Shepard inviting him to join uh, the original 19 Apollo astronauts. <laughs> As Jack says, pretty cool or pretty fast company for a 30-year-old. He served on the astronaut support crews for nine, 10, and 13 missions of Apollo. He piloted Skylab 2 for 60 days in 1973, the first time humans had ever lived at zero gravity for two months in space. He was quite, he's a living miracle, or a, med or a medical uh, miracle. He later commanded the 13th orbital flight test of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Jack was serving as the capsule commander at Mission Control when Commander Jim Lovell radioed the Mayday message, Houston, we've had a problem here. We're going to, uh, we're going to focus on Apollo 11, the 50th anniversary of that, that great event and to touch on some of the things that led up to it, some of the early flights of Mercury, Gemini, and then talk about some of the programs that followed. But the focus tonight is on Apollo 11. So uh, sit back, enjoy it. We're trying to get through this thing as, as quickly as we can, and we do have an intermission, I believe. Um, I want to, and I think that Jeff mentioned it, but once again, thank these guys that came up here. To, uh, Fred Hayes came in from, he landed in San Antonio this afternoon about 1 o'clock after being in New York City. Got to go back to Houston and the Cape and about 20 other places between now and, and the 20th. Jerry got up at 4 o'clock this morning in Los Angeles to get here. Tommy Holloway, Norm Chaffee came in from Houston. They hated to leave that traffic, but they came up anyway. 
They say, and then Jerry, I mean, then uh, Jack and I, we're, we're sluffers. We, we live here, so they like some of the others. But anyway, thank you guys. Um, one other person that hoped to be here, they couldn't, and that's the boss of all of us, and that's Chris Kraft. And uh, Chris is 95 years old. He, right now he's in the hospital. He fell and broke some ribs, but he'll, he'll be back, I think. But he really wanted to be here with us when we did this three or four years ago. He was on the stage with us. So anyway, uh, we all uh, admire our boss, uh, Chris Kraft. Go to the next slide, if you will. So it mentioned that, that we grew up in a cow pasture. There's literally, I couldn't find one of the pictures of the cows that were in that picture before. This is 1962, I think, the picture on the left. That's what the Johnson Space Center looked like then. It's called the Manned Spacecraft Center. The thing that was, this will never be repeated in our <clears throat> lifetime, for a bunch of people to live in a remote location, literally. Grocery stores were 10 miles away. We didn't have any of the conveniences. Our families were growing up, but we had this dude that said, put a man on the moon. So we put our heads down and we focused on that. And um, we literally grew up as a community, okay, that, um, that won't be happening again in our lifetime to, to face a technical challenge like that, but still to share all the day-to-day the -day problems with doing it. Probably the guys that did the atomic bomb did that, but they couldn't talk about it. So here's what it looks like in the right-hand side. It's a big metropolis. Everything down there now is, is solid homes and, and a vibrant community. Next. Well, I got back and I uh, got into uh, another uh, photo squadron and, um, and I was uh, driving off the base one evening and uh, on the weekend, gave you a, a um, newsletter, uh, a base newsletter, four pages on the front page. It says, and, uh, NASA's looking through new astronauts. Any Marine pilot with these qualifications is invited to send a couple a, a, a application to come down the Marine Corps. And I thought, John Glenn, I, I thought this was don't call us, we'll call you kind of thing, but here it is. And I thought, well, I said to myself, 10,000 people are gonna apply, I'll never make it anyway, but I'd kick myself wherever <laughs> if I didn't try when I had a chance. I thought of all of that before I got home. And I got home and I said, honey, she's out here. <laughs> How would you like to be an astronaut's wife? She says, yeah, I'd really like to do that. Let's do that. And I thought, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, I found out later she thought the same thing I did. 10,000 people apply and never make it anyway. Why start an argument? <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I had to go through, uh, send in my physical uh, uh, application and so forth. And I, uh, you, you couldn't be more than six feet tall at that time and a few other requirements. And I came back and the uh, commandant said, you're 6'1". I said, no, sir, I've not, never been that tall. It must be a mistake. Two flight physicals in a row say you're 6'1". I said, well, I bet I'm not 6'1". How about if I could make another um, measurement? So I found out that when I stood up against the door, I was 6'1". Mm -hmm. and, and, but in the, night, in the morning, that was 6'1". But at night, I was about, about five inches of an eighth of an inch shorter. And so uh, I finally went and got a measurement, and I did jumping jacks all day long. And I got the measurement, and I came in at 5'11 and 7 eighths. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I knew I was 5'13 all the time. <laughs> and, uh, so I got the call from Al Shepard one day, and he said, I, I want to know if you still want to work for us. And I said, yes, sir, I'll be there tomorrow. He said, well, not so fast. And uh, so uh, after going all the interviews and physicals and all that sort of thing, finally showed up and uh, started in the, in the classroom work that new, new guys have to do. We had a lot of classroom work for harbor mechanics, medical aspects of space flight, learn everything you need to know how about the spacecraft, how they work and so forth. And uh, then they would just send us off and uh, link us up with some of the crews that were flying and we'd be support crews. But uh, besides that, we had to do a lot of uh, geology training because we're going to go to the moon. You want to know what rocks to pick up, what's important. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this is the one in desert survival. It might be one before, but let's talk about desert survival. We had to, what, what happens if the command module comes home in a hurry and you don't have any choice as to where you're going to land like Gemini 8 did. They landed out in the Pacific Ocean somewhere near Okinawa. Well, well you better learn to live in the desert. So uh, we uh, did that uh, for a few days. 
And there's Borman and Anders, uh, or Neil Armstrong, and uh, John Young, and Deke Slayton, I think. And uh, the only thing we had to survive with was whatever came back with us. And so we made uh, clothing out of parachutes. And we, uh, this is a desert survival. We had a lot of other things to learn about that, of course, how to uh, um, um, make water when there isn't any and so forth. Water survival training is really important. The command module's come back. You see it's floating there. The command module, when it comes back, is in stable in two positions, either right side up or upside down. And uh, it was about 50-50. In fact, when I came back from Skylab, we'd been weightless for two months, and so we had to have the full treatment. We came back upside down. But you see these three balloons, we can pump those full of air, and that changes the buoyancy in the spacecraft, and it turns you right side up, and uh, and then you get in the raft without trying to, without falling in the water, and you have, uh, have to be very careful there. But uh, one of the things that can happen is one of those balloons don't work, then you're upside down and you can't get out. So what we would do is we take the, uh, go back to the next one. Yes, sir. First one, please. Uh, we uh, would uh, turn. We would take the hatch out of the tunnel and let the water come up, and there would be an air pocket above our, our heads and between us and the heat shield. And then we'd swim down through the tunnel and come back up the outside. And we practiced that, and uh, that was the mm -hmm. easy stunts, particularly if you've been in space for a while. But uh, that's part of the water survival training. Next one, we talked about the desert. Let's go on to the next one, please. Jungle survival, also, we, we might come down in a jungle. And uh, we did jungle training in uh, Panama. And uh, so we uh, lived in uh, hammocks that rained all the time. Remember that, Fred? And uh, <laughs> we lived in hammocks and uh, found something to eat the best we could. We, we divided, divided up on base, three man teams. And uh, then we also were trained to uh, uh, deal with uh, the local people. Once you were found out in a survival uh, condition, you might be among people that you didn't recognize and they might not recognize you. So we got into a river and floated down and we ended up at this guy's village. It's uh, Antonio, wasn't it? Uh, I think Fred, his name was Antonio. He was the, uh, the chief of the tribe. And so, uh, well, there's Fred in the background there and uh, all of our group. And so this was a part of our jungle survival training. Next, please. Uh, other kind of training we had to do was operationally based, I guess you might say. Uh, this is zero G training in the zero G airplane. Uh, we could fly a, 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 a Boeing 707 kind of airliner uh, the pilots would fly it up and then uh, over the top and fly it so it was zero gravity inside. And uh, we could then float around for about 20 to 30 seconds. And then the, uh, the pilot had to pull it out and we all hit the deck and 2G pull out and we just go into the next parabola like a porpoise. And uh, after, after a while, uh, well, some folks uh, didn't feel so good after a while. And uh, that's why I got called the vomit comet. And uh, I remember doing 75 of these things one trip, and uh, after that, you get kind of numb. But here's a Dave Scott, and I think that's probably Neil Armstrong in the, in the uh, left seat of the Gemini, and uh, Dave Scott's getting ready to go out and do his spacewalk, and so he's practicing this in the zero-g airplane. And uh, we could develop equipment to, uh, also to make sure it was going to work, uh, or we could do the procedures that we were going to follow in the zero-g airplane. Next, please. And we uh, also did the work in a water tank, uh, not so much for uh, landing on the moon, but uh, we had one Apollo 9 flight that had to do a, a, a spacewalk, uh, and uh, some of the command module pilots had to go out and retrieve a experiment off the uh, service module on the way back from the moon, so we could practice uh, underwater. Underwater, you can be buoyant, and, and you can uh, uh, be in this, uh, float in this medium between the floor and between the upper surface, but you had to be weighted down, especially when you fill this suit full of air, mm. you have to put about three pounds, uh, 30, uh, 300 pounds of weight on it just to keep it buoyant. And uh, so then we could uh, practice uh, spacewalking, uh, doing different uh, jobs that we were going to do underwater and perfect our procedures or our equipment. And um, um, so this was a, another way that we simulated uh, the zero gravity.